Hello and most welcome to H776 and this is going to be a key lecture that means very important so do pay specific attention this is so important uh, and it's going to return I think for the rest of uh, the 300 230 that's left of the thousand uh, I have tried to tackle this thing before uh, it hasn't really opened up to me I, I had a vague concept that it was it's all vague idea it was very important but it was a discussion the other day uh, when we talked about a payroll and what that was and in the discussion somebody said it was nothing it was the unknown or something like that and uh, I need to turn this light off. I'm just give me a sec. There. Sorry about that. This is too strong a light. Uh, I realized a pattern couldn't be nothing, it couldn't be emptiness. It didn't make really sense. So, in this discussion, the nil turned up. Nil. I think by chance has actually came, came come up earlier and that's thanks to our colleague Henrik who has been working it for I don't know how many years 20 years with nil uh, and I'm just going to show you what it is because it defies understanding uh, in computer in mathematics you have this system of squares that take a value. It can take any value, it can take one or zero, it can be constructed differently as well and take value like two or eight, something like that. And it can also be zero, means empty. Nil is not one and is not zero it means it doesn't take a value. So that is completely different. And that's the first I can say about this. It's not a value. It's not something, this one is, nor nothing, which this one is. Could be good to remember that even though zero is nothing, in contrast to something, it does do things in a computer program, in mathematics, and in our lives as well. So even though nothing is nothing, it does things. Nil doesn't do anything. It needs to be practiced, needs to be practiced for understanding. There can be no understanding of nil without doing it. It doesn't lead itself to conceptualization. And that's because it's nil. It doesn't occupy a space in conceptualization. You need to do it. And that's of course, a very big problem for the educational system because it cannot be taught in a regular basis. It needs to be practiced. And of course, this comes from practicality, but nil is more or less the same as a payroll. And nil is extremely helpful. We can stop to confuse. Usually what gets confused is these two things, the nil and the zero. They get confused, and when they get confused, they lead to an immensity of problems, because they are completely different. It's one thing to be a value, nil is not a value. It's one thing to have a function, nil is the lack of function. It's the absolute lack of function. 
One is to be a concept, one is not to be a concept. And I think even to imagine there could be things that cannot be conceptualized is a bit, it's a bit tough. But don't be worried, you can train it and you can understand it. There are millions of people who already understand it. But that takes practice. There's no other way. And this does actually remind me, and probably us, about maybe uh, at the very beginning of this uh, idea of having lectures down in the big cave of the university library. And I think it was somewhere 112. Uh, one of the nicest rooms actually with a view, uh, rather big. Uh, it was having toilets close by and everything. Maybe even a water fountain, maybe. Uh, there we took up zero and we spoke about that and I remember Neil actually came up somewhere there I think so I'm not 100% sure we cannot check because we didn't recall those things but I know it was somewhere in the discussion anyway so the first example I took this up in my head was uh, the question of a meta-language and uh, Wittgenstein says there can be no meta-language. I always assumed when he speaks about a meta-language, something above everything, I always thought to myself the place where the meta-language is, is zero. It's the opposite of having a meta-language, Wittgenstein says, there is no meta-language. What he actually said, or what he should have said, if he could, it's nil. There is no such function as a meta-language, and that's very, very different. And although Wittgenstein himself, when he wrote, seldom said no, there is no meta-language or similar, uh, or another thing. The limits of language is the limits of the world. And I always thought, and I think most of us have been thinking, von Richt, without a doubt, thought that. And some other people, some other persons uh, that interpret him think that's what it means. If you see the border, the limits of language, Language is inside and outside, I always assumed there was nothing. And I saw this as a limit in, almost like a limit of Denmark or something. Outside is nothing, or Germany or something. But the limits of Denmark is its borders. That is not what he means. And all of a sudden I start to understand Wittgenstein much better. These limits are more like the limits of the universe, so to speak. It's curved. Space is curved. So you will never ever come to a place where you can knock and say, who's out there on the other side? Because when you listen to the television or something like that, that's the perception you get. And when I was very little, there was a perception like that. Later, when I grew up, I understood that couldn't be true. But I can still not regulate the idea in my head. And I don't think anyone else could either. So if somebody asked me, Hans, what is the limit of the universe? I would say it's curved, but I wouldn't get it. Real understanding can only be done with nil. And it makes some sense. We have some problems. Uh, we can create all the concepts we need. But maybe there is some, something outside of concepts that's needed here. Otherwise, we will not get anywhere. We'll be stranded where we already were.
And this is what Wittgenstein means when he says that there are no philosophical questions. It's a nil position. It's not that it's not possible to have philosophical question. To think that it's completely wrong and that will send you into the wrong thinking alley. It's a nil position and that is completely different. And we, we mentioned this the other day. That might have helped because we talked about the famous interaction between Karl Popper, later Sir Karl Popper and Ludwig Wittgenstein at a pub in Oxford. Uh, where uh, Wittgenstein was invited to discuss some philosophical questions and when he got that popper asked him what are you doing here you are saying yourself there are no philosophical questions and uh, a sort of fight broke out apparently Wittgenstein grabbed uh, something from the fire to threaten popper with whatever that was we don't know but the fret should have been in the air. And this is actually very, very similar to what good old Martin meant by crossing up the sign. The sign is not a zero, it's not a one, it's a nil. And by having it as a nil, you evade the possibility to get stranded in this constant jumping between binary oppositions. A jumping that will never end. And also that's something that Darida understood much later. If you're stuck in that, you are stuck in the limbo in between somewhere. What he needs is something else. And you can almost say that nil is a sort of difference, but that's not absolutely correct. Heidegger understood this by doing it, but he could not tell anyone about it. It was never a conceptualized understanding. It never appears why in his writing he does it. He did it by his hand, and that's very important. And that's something you recognize in so many big thinkers, like Leonardo da Vinci did things by his hands. He couldn't explain it. He didn't even know about it. And that's very typical. This is one of those things. And this also shows for once and for all, and this is why it's also an important thing never to forget. This is why I call it key lecture, because theory plus practice always go hand in hand. They are wedded never to make parted ways, forever and ever in wedlock. And as soon as we start parting them, we end up in problems. As soon as we try to understand everything from concept, we are really in a deep pit. We need to do things as well. And this is the message of Wittgenstein. This is the message of Heidegger. And this is also the message of Nil. Do it. Otherwise, an understanding will always end up in paradoxes. In the end, it would get even worse. There would be no inkling of understanding because they go hand in hand. As soon as you take away this, this, this disappears as well. You can say that this is not something proposed. This is actually a property of what space is. This is what space does. And now I'm going to go to something that evaded my understanding for such a long time. 
and uh, I'm not alone. I really gave it a go those three years ago when we were down in U U UB in this room. I think it was called 214, something like that. And I don't know if you remember that. I think Henrik does at least. Maybe you, Kalle. And that is this thingy. The Chartus Scotti. And here you have something, and here you don't. And here you have nil. Not a something, nor a nothing. And I always thought to my head that you can actually extract that one from using these two somehow. But that's not how it works. This is radically different. So what I actually constructed practically, that was a very truncated Chattuscotti. Chattuscotti means four corners. My Chattuscotti, I realized yesterday, and I was shocked, I can tell you, I actually dropped my coffee cup when I realized that. My Chattuscotti only had two corners. So I was stuck with the old uh, Aristotelian uh, law of contradictions. Because I derived that one from these two, and I have never understood it really. But once sitting with a piece of paper and practice, I came to the understanding, this is neither. This is not the one, this is not the zero. And I'm so glad I made that revolutionary understanding. It took three years, but it's nil is also extremely helpful to understand so many concepts because it goes and comes everywhere. It is constantly present. And we need to have an understanding of that because I was actually locked in a thinking error that I couldn't get out of. Because by seeing everything as only contradictions, you cannot make proper conclusions about the world. This needs to come in. Where do we have here? Well, that's a question for you guys. I don't know what's on that side. I'm not going to press my brain so I get a brain hemorrhage today. I'm so happy about this. This is, I say, something just incredible. But what's on the other side? I think we leave that for a couple of days now. So I won't stop leading directly from my frontal lobe or something. But I think with Neil you get an understanding of every proposition, of every saying that has been said that is much clearer, much stronger, much, to the, much more to the point than it ever was. And next chapter I'm going to look one more time into Graham Priest and his paraconsistic logic. But as he points out, this is obviously something that Heidegger made, but never understood. And we can just sort of uh, associate or we can imagine what could have happened with Heidegger sat here in his fantastic Bavarian mansion and realized what he was doing. But that is tough. You can do things for a long time without understanding them. For us, it's easier. We already have it on paper. Now we need to practice it. And then we go gone past poor old Heidegger. We're going to be in a new zone all together. And in this new zone, we have much more opportunities because this is a bit like quantum computer. A quantum computer can calculate everything in the world in an instant. But you can also understand other things that evades understanding. Uh, something I thought about when we uh, spoke about Alan Bloom and Shakespeare. And I think to a certain degree, because of this fixation, the understanding of Shakespeare is gone somehow. It was open 
but this closes the understanding and makes it more and more monosemic, makes it less and less alive. Uh, and I also, also think that was one of the reasons we started to discard all knowledge, because it became stale. And what was the reason? It became monosemic. Everything that becomes monosemic loses its life. It doesn't speak to our heart anymore. It doesn't speak to our soul. And therefore, what could we do? We are going to abandon it. Where are you off to? Should I follow you? If it is. I don't know, you're disappearing. <laughs> we need to get back to this because we are losing most... I think I need to uh, angle it up a bit. We are ne leading uh, this because we are losing most of our literature. We are losing most of our uh, literary heritage. And that's a great disaster. Uh, I th wait, wait for that. I'm going to finish off here. Okay. I think that's a great disaster, uh, and the disaster is caused by us not understanding this very, very important function. And once the understanding comes, this is going to be the opening up of meanings where there no meanings existed before. Actually the same thing is going to happen to our understanding as with the quantum computer. We are, will be able to get so much more meaning out of this text, so they will resound once more like they used to do. And this is all in this fantastic thing called nil. So, I would say this could be one of the most dramatic steps forward we've done for at least, I would say, half a year. I'm, I'm completely flabbergasted. This is just amazing. Uh, I think I round up here. I think my colleague wants to have a piece of bread. And I say thank you very much and have a pleasant afternoon. Cheers. Thank you.